welcome to worship at the Unitarian Universalist Church in Eugene. To those for whom this is your first time with us, welcome. To those of you who are returning to us after a time of way, welcome back. To those of you for whom this is your spiritual and religious home, welcome. Here may you find water for your thirsting spirit and sustenance for your soul, nurture for your whole self, bread for the journey. These are hard times, times when we need to be wrapped in the arms of community, times when we need one another, sharing between us the weight of the world, handing it off day to day to one another, that we may have a reprieve, rest, and be renewed. We gather not as people united by one belief, but united by the respect for and affirmation of the multiplicity of beliefs we bring. Know that in these times, the chalice, the symbol of our faith, is deep enough and wide enough to hold us. Welcome. Two announcements this morning. The annual book sale will be held October 1st through 7th. No, it's not in person. It's more like a drive in and pick up book sale. For details, if you are intrigued, please go to our website or check the newsletter. One reminder also that if you would like to help with providing meals for the family shelter, once again, you can go to the newsletter to find out how you may sign up. And just a reminder that I will be in New Mexico for the month of October, which is why this has been pre-recorded. I apologize, that's not our usual style. I have been assured that I should have both cell phone reception and text reception most of the time. I look forward to being together with you again in November. Listen. Listen to the scratch of the match on the box that lights the flame that remains deeply silent yet calls to us. Awaken. Our broken world has need of us. Carry this chalice flame and return its constancy and silence when you are broken or in need. Listen to the flame. Our call to worship this morning is from Jessica Purple Rodela. Listen, listen to silence, listen to the wind, listen to the stars, hear trees, dance, dance to the beat of your neighbor's heart, dance to the rhythm of your childhood dreams. Come, let us howl our hallelujahs. Come, let us pray and sing and celebrate. Come, let us worship together. Please join us now in singing hymn 352, Find a Stillness.
Join me in listening to the words of Gary Kowalski for our meditation today. Maybe prayer means listening to the silences between the words. The vast, undifferentiated, and nameless wonder that underlies it all. Maybe prayer doesn't mean talking to God at all, but listening with the heart. For this morning's story, I'm going to ask you to pay attention to one of your senses specifically. First, I'll ask you to just prepare the space around you and listen to what is around you. What are you hearing? Do you have a fan on? Do you have uh, a, a cat um, meowing in the background? Whatever you can do to, to silence your space, take a second to do that. The world around us is interconnected. Everything natural and alive is part of the greater holiness. I invite you now to close your eyes and to listen to some sounds of the natural world. See if you can listen well and identify a few of these. We'll ask you to share your answers in the chat at the end of the exercise.
What good listeners you all are. And now we'll listen to the words of T.S. Eliot. At the still point of the turning world, neither fleshless nor flesh, neither from nor toward, at the still point, there the dance is, but neither arrest nor movement, and do not call it fixity, where past and future are gathered, neither movement from nor toward, neither ascent nor decline, except for the point, the still point. When the folk duo Simon and Garfunkel released the song, The Sounds of Silence in 1964, it was an instant hit. I mean, what a concept that silence had sound. It was so in the language of the times, heavy and to many mind expanding. That silence can have sound is, is not new to the mystics or the meditators or those who pray across all the world's religions. In fact, silence, it was sought out, it was entered into in an effort to find something beyond the language of any culture. Both the Buddha and Christ went to silence to allow it to speak to them for discernment, for knowledge. And monks and nuns and ordinary people who are seekers or seeking more information or somehow to commune with something beyond themselves have traveled the path of silence for millennia. There writes the poet T.S. Eliot, at the still point of our turning world, there the dance is. The dance that is beyond our known movements, that dance that follows a cosmic heartbeat, that dance that is an essence of being. True silence, as we all know, is harder and harder to come by in our world because human encroachment fills even the most remote places, those places that inspired that question, if a tree falls in the forest and there is no one there to hear it, does it make a sound? Those places where that question came from. Yet, even if silence, which is most often defined as the lack of sound, is not available to us, we can still enter into it. It has to do with finding silence amidst the chaos and the fracas that fills our world. It has to do with quieting the mind and finding the still point that is beyond sound. And there in that place, something else for lack of better words speaks, reveals something. Silence once rid of inner and outer distractions is a place full of sound. Silence is often linked to or assumed when we think about or talk about listening. We seek silence to listen. There are at least three forms of silence. Listening for, listening to, and simply listening as being fully present in the moment, sometimes known as mindfulness. The discipline of entering silence and listening for its sounds is a time-honored tradition, quieting and emptying and stilling the mind to commune with one's God or the oneness of all that is, entering silence with the hope that such a God will speak or will find us, entering silence to hear the mysteries of being. It is a silence that seeks. Listening to is an act of taking in words or sounds or energy. It seeks to know and to understand it, to hear. It's not just waiting for the other person to shut up so you can jump in to the conversation and talk about your experience. It's a listening and a silence that clears the way for. The phrase hearing each other into speech was coined by Methodist Nell Morton to describe what used to happen in what was known as women's consciousness raising groups. 
women's voices for so long had been quashed or belittled. But being in the presence of other women who made space for those voices allowed women to find their own voices and find them they did. And it's something that a good therapist does, create and hold the listening space for persons to find their voices, their own answers, discover their own way. Maybe some of you have had this experience of being heard into your own speech or clarity because somebody simply listened deeply to you. It's a precious gift that we can offer one another. Have you ever been truly, deeply listened to? Have you ever offered the gift of deeply listening to another? How rare is this, this form of listening, which often comes only in silence in today's world? Listening with no expectation seems to be a spiritual form of listening. It's, it's distinguished from hearing. We constantly hear our world. It, it is background and it's foreground noise, but sometimes we tune it in and most of the time we tune it out. We're just used to all that constant noise. It surrounds us like clothing. But to listen is to go deeper than hearing. It's to distinguish the soundscape. Think of a choral piece of music. Many sections, many harmonies, and a melody that form a whole sound, a whole piece. And those who listen can often hear that whole, but also pick out the singular parts of the vocal sections. Sometimes listening is about sounds. Sometimes it's about the sounds of silence that are fecund and full. Both listening and silence interrupt life as we know it. At the age of 21, Neil Harbison, who is colorblind and only sees the grayscale, heard color. What he did was assign colors a musical frequency. He wears a bone conducting device that makes him look like a cyborg. In his TED talk, Harbison explains that the eyeborg in front of his head detects the frequency of the color in front of him and transmits it to a chip at the back of his head. It then converts the color into sound waves because he's assigned each color a musical note. He can hear just one color or a symphony of colors. And when he attends the funeral, he says that he wears purple and turquoise and orange because to him, the musical notes sound a somber minor chord. He's even assigned celebrities their own sound or color combination. And for his talk, he wore bright yellow pants, a stunning blue t-shirt, and a pink jacket, which he said was a C major chord. For Harbison, sounds become color. He began wearing his cyborg eyeborg in 2003, and in 2004, he started dreaming in color. He says that his software that he had created and his brain had united. Harbison says that, quote, knowledge comes from the senses. And if that one can extend the senses, one can extend the knowledge. By the way, he is an artist using color Listening for Harbison opened up an entire world that was previously inaccessible. Watch his talk. You too can join his cyber foundation. One of the exercises that was suggested for this month's theme, which is, if you haven't noticed by now, deep listening, was to listen to a recording of a song that's very familiar. And the example they gave was the Beatles' Blackbird only it was sung in Micmac by a 16-year-old indigenous person from Cape Breton. Cape Breton's in Halifax, the East Coast. The idea by doing this exercise is to see what listening to that song in another language offers. What could you hear differently about the song 
even without understanding the words. One listens differently to a song that's sung in a language that's not one's own. You hear the familiar and something new or different. That's why today you will hear three versions of Leonard Cohen's song, Hallelujah. The first that was in the video prior to the service sung by Rabbi Lauren Holtzblatt, who was Ruth Bader Ginsburg's rabbi. The second version was sung by Mitch. And the third will be a refrain by Suzanne on the piano. The same song, one in Hebrew, one in English, one without words. Each version a unique way of listening to the song. Each interpretation, perhaps revealing something you had not heard before, granting you new insight or meaning. If you go on to the Amazon website, I know we're not supposed to do that, but if you do and you look up books about listening, you're going to find that a majority of them are about being listened to and understood, about how to communicate one's needs and feelings. The books are slanted toward how to let others know that they are being listened to. Few are about listening to oneself or entering the sounds of silence. You think that listening would be second nature to we humans. But think about the last time you really listened to a person, a piece of music, the sounds of your living space or area. In our multitask ridden world, listening joins conversation as a lost art. What does listening involve? Our attention focused usually singularly on what is right in front of us. Some people feel listened to or encouraged to keep talking if the person who's listening encourages them by saying things like, uh-huh, hmm, tell me more, or if they nod their head to indicate that they are listening to you. Others find those responses to be an interruption or a distraction. And if you want to know how you listen, now is the chance because the Zoom platform offers each of us instant information on how we listen. It's like a mirror is being held up to, and we see ourselves as well as others. In Divinity School, I was given the opportunity one inter winter break to spend a week at the Still Point community in Vermont. It was a community of nuns run by a Cuban nun who had a very heavy Spanish accent. And she announced to the other nuns that Lois Van Leer from jail was coming to stay with them for a week. It took the nuns a while to realize that I was actually a seminary student and not recently released from jail. Sister Sylvia, that head nun, spent a short time with me each day, encouraging me to spend the rest of my time in silence. In that time of my life, silence was the enemy. Who knows what I thought I would find or discover or dredge up if I kept silence. But many years later, I found myself preparing to spend three weeks of a sabbatical in silence at the Kalmaldi Hermitage, south of Big Sur. It's located about a mile and a half straight up off Highway 101 and has a beautiful view of the coastline. It was a time of silence and deep listening to that silence. It was still full of external and yes, internal sound. It was revealing. Conversations I overheard in the common areas felt like decibels deafening me. When the three weeks was up, all I wanted to do was return to my little trailer up there and remain in silence and in deep listening mode. I would encourage you to take just even a day to spend in silence. You don't have to be alone. You can do it with one other person, a whole family, some kind of grouping of people. And enter it with no expectation, just to see what it offers you. It's not just demons and terrors that await you. It can be insight, calm, room to metaphorically breathe, or a waste of your time. Only you can determine that.
Recently, I've been thinking about the purpose of religion as something more than a form of social control. And I landed on religion trying to answer the question of how shall we live? This was the name of two international UU youth conferences that I had taken part in when I first came into Unitarian Universalism. One was in Transylvania and one was in India. At that time, I wasn't really sure why we were focusing on that question. Now I understand that that question is the religious question. How shall we live? It's the question that religion seeks to answer. Some traditions have sacred te texts and doctrine that answer that question for you, and it makes sense. Who wouldn't want someone to have it all figured out in this day and age? But we you use, we joke that ours is a religion where all your answers will be questioned. Unitarian Universalism asks each one of us to engage with and answer that question for ourselves. Yes, our principles and our sources offer guidance and pretty clearly state what it is that we hold to be of value. But the work of day-to-day -day living is up to us to take responsibility for. Now more than ever, I find that we must ask ourselves each day, how shall we live? What is right action? What can we do? We have to find the space and silence to hold that question out before us as we go about each moment of our days, almost like a mission statement. We have to listen deeply to ourselves and to others who are trying to answer that question for themselves. Parker Palmer wrote, before I can tell my life what I want to do with it, I must listen to my life telling me who I am. If you listen deeply to your life, what is it trying to tell you? What is silence telling you? You don't have to run off to some hermitage for a week or a year to find silence. You know, it can be carved out and taken from our days. A time of silence could begin and end our days. A time of listening to and being listened to can begin and end our days. Silence can offer a reprieve from the cacophony of political, economic, and social sounds that surround every moment. Perhaps in the madness of our turning world, silence can offer us the still point, the place where life's dance is, where the sounds of silence that we find there help us know who we are. I hold out the invitation to each of you to enter silence, to listen deeply, and to live into this question, how shall we live? Maybe so, so be it, blessed be. Hallelujah. We all have moments in our lives that we want to share with our community our ups and our downs that make up our lives and our love. Please join us in the chat with your joys and sorrows that you wish to share with this community at this time. For beautiful music, for beloved family members already gone and still with us, for deep listening to nature all around us, we are thankful. For those who've lost everything in the fires, for all of the noise in our country right now, for those who have contracted the coronavirus who do not have adequate care, for all of these things and those that are held still in your hearts and those which I did not name, you are not alone in your joys or your sorrows. We are with you. We will hold these things in our hearts. We pray with you. We breathe with you. We work to enact change with and for you. Please join me now 
and singing our response hymn number 1002, Comfort Me. Our offering words this morning are adapted from Paul Beadle. Once upon a time, most folks use the offering plate to fulfill their pledges of financial support. Nowadays, lots of folks click on their church websites or set up automatic transfers from their checking accounts. Some still write a monthly check paying their church bill along with the others. But passing the offering plate was never just a practical exercise. There's always been a ritual. Even if your pledge is paid up, what is dropped in the, in the plate is a ritual, ritual reminder of that form of love we call generosity. offerings of generosity with gratitude. May they be used to transform our lives and serve our world. Please join in singing Go Lift It Up, hymn number 1057. Go forth today. May you dance at the still point. May you enter silence with abandon. May you find its sounds and its revelations. May you live into the question how shall we live? May it be so. So be it. Blessed be. Mm -hmm. 